Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is a super cool episode all about the gear of John Bonham. And I am joined by two Bonham experts. I've got Mr. Terry Keating, aka Bonzolium. Terry, welcome. Hi there. <laughs> and I've got George Flutus, aka Bonhamology. George, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks. Yes. You're you're both return guests. Um, George, you were on, uh, I think I called it the John Bonham episode, which was super popular episode. It was my, by far my most popular episode. Uh, and then Terry, wow. I had you on and I thought, everyone knows this guy from Bonham. We're going to do and a different one. it's my least popular episode. <laughs> <laughs> that one stunk. No, that was, we talked about collecting and that was a really fun oh, yeah, one. yeah, I um, forgot about the, yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah. It was cool to get a different, you know, a different side of um, Terry for that one. But so today, I think it's going to be really cool because we are kind of going down the list and it's a gear episode. We're going to be talking about John Bonham, Bonzo, um, his drum sets. We can talk about cymbals, mics, whatever comes up along the way um, and kind of do a, you don't know, I guess a definitive look at each drum set. He was 32 years old when he died and, uh, you know, pretty short life. So um, let's just jump right in here, guys. And I think, George, we're going to start with you on his pre-Zeppelin drum sets. So what is the first drum set we're going to talk about today? Well, um, as far as I know from what I've read, his first drum set might have, it may have been a premiere. Terry, you could probably confirm that. Um <laughs> <laughs> you got your specs on now. You can see me. Yep. Um, what? Up. What? But he was, yeah, he, yeah, you yeah. know, he was like 15 years old, a teenager, teenager with a Brit, with a with an old rusty kid. I think he described it as mostly rust. Um, yeah. But the first kit that I've ever seen photos of, uh, chronologically speaking, was a Trixon kit that looked like it was some sort of pearl finish, like a a black pearl or maybe blue. It's a black and white uh, photograph. So, you know, you can't tell really what the color was, but it looks like it might be a black diamond pearl kit. And it's a tricks on kit. And he's all of about 16 and playing this kit. And they're the only couple photos that, that I know of um, pre Zeppelin of him behind a drum set. There are no, it's kind of hard to, hard to believe, but there are no other yeah. photographs of him sitting at a drum set before Zeppelin. So or at least that we've ever seen. Yeah. I mean that, I mean that you, some might show that are out here. Like, hey yeah. man, look who this is, you know? Yeah. And when I, when I came across that photo, there's, there's like two photos of him at that time. And he's, um, you know, wearing like a suit jacket and his hair. Yeah. Is, right. Yeah. The guys you know, have suits. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's kind of mod looking, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's sixty four, right? Isn't that when it's from? I don't know the exact the year, but it was with Terry Webb and the Spiders, and so who knows how long he had that kit? But yeah, by right. the time he started playing with Zeppelin in sixty eight, we know that he was playing a Slingerland kit, and uh, it was thought that kit was maybe Green Sparkle. Jason Bonham actually confirmed not too long ago that it was a Blue Sparkle kit. 22 13 16 and uh he had a he had a superphonic five five inch superphonic snare an lm 400 and you can see some photos of of him playing that kit from zeppelin's early earliest tour which is when they played some dates in scandinavia in in like mm-hmm. september of 1968 so you know the band basically came together that summer august of 68 there's a recording of Bonzo with Tim Rose that's from sometime in the summer of 68 before he joined Zeppelin. And in that recording, you can hear the drum sound is really similar to the sound of the drums on the first album. So mm-hmm. wow. I suspect that this Slingerland kit was his primary kit, you know, in those early days and up to the recording of Zeppelin one. There was there's there's talk in in books um, like Thunder of Drums and uh, maybe you know some other articles about Bonzo's gear that he had a Ludwig Super Classic I think a Green Sparkle mm-hmm. kit. There's no evidence of that kit. There's no photographs of it. Um, so if he did have that kit, I I just you know I I, I don't know of him ever playing it on a studio session. 
uh, without having photos from you know the, the studio sessions for the first album, it's anyone's guess. But my gut yeah. feeling is that he was playing the kit that he was playing on those first dates with Zeppelin the month before, which was that Slingerland yeah. Blue Sparkle kit. And then you see he has that kit through the end of 68 when they're doing gigs in England. And then uh, at the end of December 68, they came to America for the first time. And so he had a kit that was a Ludwig uh, 22, 13, and 216 floor toms, black diamond pearl Ludwig. Now, I don't know if he bought that kit or if that kit was like a backline or it was a rental that he got once he got to the States with the band for their very first tour. But he he was only playing that kit from the end of December, last week of December, until the end of January, which is when he gets the Maple Thermal Gloss kit that's iconic, you know, very famous, famously associated with that kit. Now, Carmine, uh, a piece, is the one who hooked him up with the deal with Ludwig, and that's because they were touring together in January of 69. So he, you know, that black diamond pearl kit, I mean, Terry, maybe you can, you know, chime in here on that. We, we saw some photos, Terry shared some photos of that kit as it was being prepared for an auction. And it ended up going to the museum of, uh, what's the name of that museum? M pop in Seattle. Robert Plant auctioned it, right? He donated yeah, it to the auction. Yeah, he donated it, right? And and, um, and it was interesting because it was a twenty-two, and 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 it had the the, the telescoping um, legs, like the big twenty. You know, Ludwig used to do those on the bigger drums, sort of before they developed the longer legs for the bigger drum. But for whatever reason, on a twenty-two, there it is, um, two on each side. And uh, but this fella sent me an email, maybe what, like maybe four years ago now. Yeah, a few years so, ago. You, you know, you saw the ad. It was either online or something. It was one of the auction houses or something. There's Robert Plant standing next to somebody, and there's this five-piece or four-piece kit. Actually, there was a jazz festival with it at the auction, which you can yeah. see in the pictures, too. A magic right. black diamond pearl, keystone badge. And um, so we sent some good pictures of it. Uh, so apparently this fellow who this was, who I think is in England somewhere, um, is like a known drum cleaner upper person. You know what I mean? Like a, like a Maybe like an ex-tech for somebody. So he totally like cleaned them up, and then they and then they auctioned them off, or they donated them, or I don't know. Yeah, I believe yeah, they was, were. I believe they were auctioned, and Paul Allen, right? That's the guy who ran the. Uh, uh, that's his museum, the Museum of of Popular Music, or whatever it's called. The M-Pop I've heard of that in Seattle. I've seen pictures. So, yeah, yeah, it was on display there for a while. The kit was set up, and it said John Bonham's first drum kit or something. Wow. Now that kit ended up going to the drummer Tony Newman great drummer who played with he's on david bowie's live album and i have some photographs of tony newman playing that kit and he talked about in this little article about how he acquired the kit from bonham he doesn't say what he did with it but i'm assuming he must have at some point given it back to Ro given it to robert plant or sold it to him i don't know because the kit was supposedly in robert plant's possession and robert was the one who had it um, cleaned up, you know, and prepared for this auction by this drum tech guy or this drum shop in England. Um, our friend Billy Harrington, I think he knows who who that was, the shop in England that, that did that work. Another yeah, interesting thing is the snare drum. I guess it's interesting to us because we're bottom fanatics, but to, uh, <laughs> the snare drum is a chrome slingerland like five and a half, like a, one, of, one of those Gene Krupa, you know. Uh, Sound King. Sound King, yeah, yeah. With like yeah. the three lines through it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, and you can yeah. clearly see that he's playing a metal Slingerland snare on those early dates hmm. in, in late 68, early 69. And then within a few weeks, he's got the Maple Thermogloss. And I, I think the first gig that he played the Maple Thermogloss kit on is in Boston, that's likely the first gig, like it's like January, party? yeah, like January twenty third, somewhere in there, twenty third, twenty fourth. This episode is brought to you by Sweetwater. Sweetwater just sent over this awesome brand new Roland SPD SX Pro sampling pad. 
This is so cool and has amazing sounds and feel when you're trying to do like snare rolls or cymbal work. It just really picks up every little detail. And the percussion sounds in this are super cool and very realistic sounding. Whether you're gonna be flying solo and using just the SPDSX Pro or make like a hybrid kit kind of setup or mix this with any other electronic device or anything else you want, it is really the best way to go. There's so many cool things about this, but one more really neat thing is you can um, set the LED lights that divide up the pads to let you know which pad you're hitting so you don't have to like mark with tape that which is which and this is a click and this is a bass drop. You can just mark it with a, a customizable LED color, which is awesome. So uh, thanks to Sweetwater for sending this over and sponsoring this episode. Check it out at the link in the description of this episode and you can see the Drum History gear page on Sweetwater and see the SPD SX Pro by Roland and a bunch of other cool gear there. So thanks to Sweetwater. I also want to throw out there before we kind of move on, just just so I don't forget about it. I do want to mention that it's really neat with these photos, how you said with the Slingerland kit um, about how you're looking at a black and white picture and you don't know what color that is. Like it's it's like I think it was green. And then, like you yeah. said, Jason confirms that it's blue. It's like that even adds more mystery to this kind of stuff that you. Yeah, it's all, I, you know, <laughs> someone had tinted the photos. Those photos are from a. Danish, I think, ph photographer uh, Jürgen Ang Ang Angel, Angel, Jürgen, Jürgen Angel. Angel. Yeah, <laughs> you have one of those prints, right, Terry? I have an actual, I have an actual Jürgen Ag Angel print here. Bottom yes. behind the kit, he's got the mallets. He's like, yes, wow. right, right, right. And so those <laughs> yeah. photographs, somebody tinted maybe that that very one, colorized, yeah, made it look like, or co know. colorized it and made the made the sparkle green. So I yeah, think because so it had been online for so long. This well, colorized like said, photo, people are like, well, there, oh, yeah, that was a green sparkle Slingerland, you know. Yeah, but yeah. like in some books over the years, they did talk about a, a green sparkle 22, 13, 16, that supposedly even some place, which was uh, in England for higher place, took back, painted it black, rented it. I mean, you heard that story went around for a long time. Do you remember that? Yeah, that would have been like the, that would have explained the Ludwig kit, right? Yeah, right. You know, but I just, I, there's never no pictures of that, you know. But yeah, yeah but anyway, so back to the thermogloss, which Billy, what did Billy tell us about what three drums he got first? Are you, is this a, a quiz? Yes, to you. <laughs> 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 do, 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 yeah, do, you. The three, drums he got, um, the three drums that he got first, hmm, let's see. Did he get a bass drum? Did he get a 13? Just the 14 by 12 and this 18. Yes. yes. Yeah, right. I got the ba one of the bass drums, well, the uh, 12 by 14 and the 16 by 18 without tone controls. They did not have tone controls. Right. That's right. what Billy said. But the, now, but, the, but the 9 by 13 oh, and the 16 by 16, he got a little after that, Billy yeah. thinks, that he yeah. had, as we see. And, and the second bass drum. And the second bass drum. So maybe he got the the second bass drum initially, but just didn't use it because there's yeah, there's right. an interesting story. And now two people have now told me through, uh, well, John Hyde, who's a drummer who played with the band Detective. I don't know if you know about Detective, but they were on Swan Song Records. And John Hyde is from the Boston area, or he you know grew up there. Um, and he said when he saw Zeppelin, he could swear Bonham had two bass drums. And well, what? No, but what? What location would that have been? How at did the Tea Party, but it would have either been January of '69 or May, I think, of '69. And he doesn't recall the the month. He just said that he was playing two bass drums. Now, at first, I thought, well, maybe he just misremembered that, or you know, because yeah. there are a couple photos from the Tea Party gig in January of '69. And he's he's just playing one bass drum. Yeah, he doesn't right. have two bass drums set up. But another person recently, I think it was a YouTube comment, told me that he also saw Bonzo at the tea party in January of '69, and that he had two bass drums. Well, how now, many, how many is, shows did they do? They did in, they did two shows. They did an afternoon show and an evening show. So the the existing photos are just from one show. So it's very right. possible that that other show, maybe he tried out the two bass drums. You know, there's yeah, this right. 
there's this story about how Peter Grant and Jimmy, like no one liked the two bass drums and they were like, it's yeah, too much. That. It's overkill, <laughs> you know, lose, lose it. And when he tried using the two bass drums later in the summer of 69, he pulled the two bass drums back out and set them up. And there's a few gigs where he's using double bass drum. Yeah, like four or five gigs, right? And then yeah, there's the at top. least five gigs where he Sorry, was okay. using them in a row in, in August of 69, July and August. And I think that might be the time when Robert Plant, you know, said, he, he tells a story about how they used to hide Bonzo's other bass drum because they didn't want him to play it. <laughs> so that would have likely been at that time. You know, he was probably ah, like, oh, I'm going to try this. I want to try it, you know. Yeah. And yeah, they're yeah. like, hide Bonzo's bass drum quick, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Man. Yeah. So, Too much thunder. Yeah. 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 Now, one interesting thing, Terry, you can talk about that is the depth of the bass drums, which, you know, yeah. for most people, they assume Bonzo always played a 26 by 14. Yeah, well, that's but, the thing. You know, it used to be years ago, before the Internet and everything, you know, all we'd have is like books to pour over. And whenever I would look at the Ludwig Thermogloss, whenever I would look at the kit, there was only one picture I think I ever saw where it looked from the side like it was 14, like a standard run-of-the-mill 14 by 26. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It always looked deeper. And, you know, sometimes you'd say, like, back in those days, I'd always say 16. But then later on, somebody sent me some pictures of a 16 by 26, so I wasn't sure. So then my theory for a while was that maybe the lugs, for maybe a year or so, Ludwig might have put the lugs di as a different spacing. You know what I mean? Like maybe they were, each lug yeah. was much closer to the edge, yeah. so it made it look, you know. But it just was always, I'd always be like, God, that bass drum, you know. So uh, yeah. I'd made videos out over the years. George and I, we Zeppelin freaks that always talk about, you know, just that we'd say 16, but it just, there was just something never sat well with it, you know? So sure enough, this fellow, Billy Harrington, who's playing in Chicago tonight in a band, he's, he's on tour, uh, went and met with Paul Thompson, sat out, interviewed him. The interview went into Modern Drummer like three, two or three years ago. And sure enough, right. Billy Harrington solved the mystery. They were 15 inches deep. They weren't 14 mm. inches deep. They weren't 16. They were 15. There was a period of time, ironically, that back well, that back in the day, Carmine Apice had had his specs with Ludwig. He'd switch the bass drum. He wanted his 26s when he ordered them from Ludwig. I don't know, maybe his 24 too. But his 26s because he said he had a leady drum way back in the day that was 15 inches deep. So he always had Ludwig do that. So when he called Ludwig and said, hey, give him, you know, my kit, you know, give bottom, you know, my kit. They were probably like, oh, yeah, okay, well, 26 by 15. And then yeah. gave him these drums, you know. The fact that he had, um, you know, a 15 inch deep, I think the fact that, that Billy was actually there to measure them in person is really really wild and great. And, you know, Paul Thompson ended up with that kit, but I think Paul Thompson from Roxy Music, he he has the kit now. Hmm. And the Tom Tom wow. was cut down. That 14 by 12 Tom Tom, the iconic big Tom Tom, you know, that was cut down. And I don't know if he it cut it down or Colin Fairley. I think Colin Fairley did. He said that's Colin Fairley did. That's the drummer. Wow. came to him like that. Yeah, he right. So Colin Fairley had the kit first. What was the name of the band he was with? The something jug band, string jug band. Yeah, or something? something like that. Buggy's yeah. jug band or something. <laughs> yeah. Peapod carrot. There's even a photo Man. of the kit. There's even a photo of the kit on a single of theirs that we we unearthed at some That's point. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a single, like one of their hit singles, and he's playing Bonham's kit in like 1973 or something. Yeah. And. I don't remember if the Tom was already cut down or it was still bottom. I think it was still I, 14 I by 12. I think it was 12. still big. Yeah, it still looked yeah. like bottom size, I think, in that picture. It was that professionally. A lot of, I mean, even at that point, you'd think that you would realize the weight of cutting down a drum set like that. I mean, you know, that's John Bonham's drums. You would think you would want to leave them. Yeah, I mean, but, it was early. You know, it was like 1970, right. 71. I mean, yeah. Zeppelin were big, but they weren't, they weren't, you know, the yeah. icons they would become. That's true. And I find it interesting yeah. that once Bonzo got an an endorsement, or at least got that Maple Thermogloss kit, now he played that kit pretty much from January of 69 through um, spring of 70. So not that long. You know, really, it was just over a year that he played that kit. 
Was there a reason he didn't use them for that long, or did he just want to move on to something else? Is that documented anywhere he didn't like the no, sound? No, I, d- or- I, I don't know. I just know that I think he regretted giving them away. You know, I've heard that, that he, like, ran across whoever it was he gave them to, Colin Fairley or something, and I think he sold them for, like, five pounds or something. It was one of those... Those stories, you know, I, who knows yeah, yeah. How, how true it is, but yeah, but it's like, what do you got in your like, pocket? Give me what do you got in your pocket? Go. Exactly. Yeah, and he's like, oh, you know, geez. I only got five pounds. And he said, all right. But I, I from what I, I've read, he regretted letting them go. Um, he got his first green sparkle kit probably in May or June of 1970. So they had finished their U.S. tour in around like March or April of 70. And th- that was the last time he played that kit. Before we move on from the maple kit, maybe describe a little bit too about what his symbol setup would have been on that. Terry, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what kind of symbols, little hardware. He was a big Swivomatic guy, obviously. So what was he using at that point, uh, well, symbol-wise? Well, yeah, you'd see, well, you'd see that he, I think he loved the Swivomatic hi-hat and those, and those, what they call them, the swan leg symbol stands. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you'd see him in that one. There's some pictures they unearthed in the, in the studio, and Bottoms either taken off or putting on his brand new 602 on the Rogers symbol stand. But yeah, I think you know when you see the pictures um, from whatever the Gladzax Teen Club, you know September October 1968, you know Bottoms on those Slingerlands, and you see the symbols are. I mean they're Zildjians. You can see you know it's a classic Zildjian shape, you know. But I think by the time he. Uh, Got the um, thermogloss. Um, he generally speaking, you see, he's with six o twos. You know, when you see him at like the, um, the there is an interesting thing. It seemed like, I, in my opinion, I always say to George, I've talked to people. It seems like he kept one of the Zildjians for a while. It seemed like on his left, sometimes it looked like he, he used to love having a sixteen, like in the early days. You know, and then an eighteen on his right. But I think it kind of went sixteen, eighteen, and then he'd have a sixteen. And and you know, there's sometimes he'd have two symbols on the left crash, and even two on the right. But I think so. It was generally, I think Zildjian's then 602s. He kept a Zildjian around for a while. 602s, um, and then when the giant beats came, he, you know, he got the giant beats, you know, and then went to the yeah. 2002s. Generally, after that, with the 602 every now and then, keeping a giant beat or two, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard to tell because there are no clear photos of those first from those first few months of his symbols. You know, like shots from above, or where you can yeah, actually yeah. see the symbols sure. clearly. There is one shot that's a color picture shot from above when they were on Danish TV for like the Danish radio, and you know it's called Denmark's B Y E N uh, television special, and that Danish TV shot to me clearly looks like the col- you know like the how six o twos have a certain tone. They're kind of a gold, light gold mm-hmm. tone. Yeah. yeah. It looks like that. They don't look like giant beats. Giant beats are darker. Yeah, yeah. You know, giant beats have a different profile too, but I mean, giant beats have a distinctive color. They're more coppery looking. Well, plus the, plus the, the bells are bigger in a certain way. You yeah. Know, a larger bell. But also to it, that Dan Marks, that's, that's a 16 on his left. Yeah, he's got a, maybe a 24, could be a 23. You never know because they made a 23 then. There was a, a an actual Led Zeppelin document that described Bonham's 602 symbol as 23. Did you find that, George? You and I were talking yes, about that. I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it described yeah. the symbol as a 23. It said 23. So he had a 16 on his left and an 18 on his right, and they look bright, you know, gold. So those, to me, that's like, and 14-inch hats. So, you know, right. Bonham is iconically associated with 2002s he really yep. didn't play 2002s for that i mean he he played them of course from about 73 onward but those early days you know before they were made and even after he was using a giant beat ride for pretty much all of 73 and 75 hmm. um, i feel like he gets he, would, he gets like uh things that become iconic for him are because of like one super iconic photo and then that's what he, yes. people think he played all the time. Yeah. He would mix and match, I'm sure. Like, you know, the hi-hats that he was using early on, I think, were 602s, 14s, and then 15s. And then he started using the Sound Edge 602s. 
Um, I haven't seen any photos of him clearly playing giant beat hats, honestly. Yeah, and yeah. I've mm-hmm. done like a pretty thorough um, investigation. Now, I just there was symbols. another. See, whenever I hear George talk about this, I always think of other conversations we've had. Did we ever, you know, George, when you farted around your six oh two fifteen inch high hats or your fifteen inch giant beat hats, and you play the intro to rock and roll, which sounds more dead on to you? To me, to me, the, the giant, giant beats, beats always do. Yeah. yeah, to me, the giant beats do too, which is funny yeah. because at that time live, he was using Sound Edge 602s, 602 yeah, and he yeah. was using giant beat symbols all around 24, yeah. 18, 20, all right. giant beats. Yeah, but the hats were always Sound Edge 15s. Yeah, well, you know that's the thing—an original pair of giant beat hats. That's the thing. Original giant beat hats. There's some that they're more in the Zildjian sort of realm in the sense that there's really great sounding pairs, good sounding pairs, and then some that not so much. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, and they're also like, quite thin, so they yeah. will typically dent very easily. Mm. And I would imagine that even if Bonzo liked the sound of them, it would have been like, man, I can't use these live. They just yeah. get yeah. bent up really quickly. You know, for yeah. as hard as he would hit. Yeah. So, so as far as symbols go, yeah, I mean, I, I think in the early the the earliest days of Zeppelin, likely a mix of maybe uh, Zildjian and maybe even like British companies like Zinn, you know, like Bill sure. Ward from Black Sabbath played Zinn, Ringo had Zinn symbols. Sure. Um, but certainly by the time he's got the thermal gloss kit and they're, you know, well known. He's got. He's using Giant Beats or 602s. Okay. Yeah. Giant Beats came later. The 602s, I think, for most of '69, and then in early '70, there's there's actually a Peisty document that shows that he was given a bunch of Giant Beats in February of '70. Yeah, you're more likely to use your awesome new symbols and not mix and match when you're just you have an endorse endorser giving you all this stuff. I mean, it makes well, yeah. perfect sense. Well, that's yeah. the thing too. Remember, yeah. Ludwig in America at that time was the Peisty distributor yeah so if he got signed exactly. up with carmine i'm sure it was like yeah totally. throwing you know the sim you know what i mean he was using the the 26 14 18 setup for several months uh before he started adding the 16 so i think what happened was when they got through sh- the chicago area in the middle of 1969 he probably got a bunch of new stuff he got some little bongos and I think they might be thermal gloss as well. He had a set of yeah, bongos. yeah, yeah. He also had a sixteen yeah. now, but you know, and he had a thirteen, which Billy saw, which we never see, you know, anywhere. But he had a thirteen by nine, Tom. He yeah, also yeah. got what looks like a whole slew of new six o twos because there's some photos from Chicago. The yeah, from the playground. kinetic playground, the symbols yeah. are like right the out symbols, of the bag. You can see fingerprints on them. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're like right like out, brand the 602s new. right out of the bag. So what I would love to know is, did Bonzo go to the Ludwig factory here on Damon Avenue? So I heard did he, he ha- did. Somebody said he actually did. Really? Like somebody yeah. took him wow. over there? That yeah. would be really cool to know. Mm. Yeah, as a, kid, a picture as a of that. Kid, oh, my God. Yeah, as a kid, I went in that factory because a, f- a friend of mine in high school, his father Lucky was a woodshop for Doug. Oh, man. Yeah. So I used to get, to used to get discounts on some bits like sticks and drum cases. And, yeah. You know, because George my is wheeling awesome. timpani out the back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I never got that. Yeah, didn't get yeah. that. Far, of all the but... things to steal, a timpani might be the uh, hardest. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so then, for the sake of time, moving on to the Green Sparkle kit. Yes. Man, I love personally. I don't know if it's because I saw this kit when I was younger, but something about Green Sparkle is just awesome. I love it. I like yeah. Blue Sparkle. I have a Blue Sparkle snare behind me, but it's like. Green Sparkle is just something something special about it. Um, so, it's got a holiday. Uh, it's got kind of a holiday <laughs> vibe. You know, it makes yeah. you happy just to see it. It well, does. You know, but there's also like two different sort. There's the more Kelly green, green sparkle, the older days. And then there's sort yep. of the 1969, 70, 71. The teeting, like, kind of the blue. teeting green. Yeah, kind of a more of a blue, <laughs> wi- minty green. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's, yeah. Your, um, what's your preference? Are you I, the... I kind of like the older... Do you remember anybody familiar with currency? Back until back in back in the <laughs> older days, the, the lighter green part of currency used to be more of a Kelly green versus the okay. blue green, and it was sort of the same with sparkle wraps too. Hmm. It, it was just uh. more like a Kelly green, you know what I mean? Like almost like the wall behind you. 
But then, yeah. Yeah. You, then right. you know, Ludwig and some of the companies. Actually, I think um, Slingerland stayed with that shade a little. Anyway, let's stick yeah. with the love. I am familiar with currency, but not that closely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I got all no. kinds of it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about the Green Sparkle kit. You know, like I said, he got that kit while they were recording the third album. So I don't know if some of the third album was on the Thermogloss kit and some of it was on the Green Sparkle or it was all with the Thermogloss and then he got the Green Sparkle. I don't know. There's no way to know that either without seeing session photos. But what I do sure. know is the first time that kit was used was in Reykjavik, Iceland. And it was sort of a warm-up gig. They, they hadn't played live since, I think, April. And they were recording the album, the third album, and they had a big concert at the Bath Festival, the Bath Blues and, uh, you know, folk music festival, which is a massive festival. And as a preparation for that gig, they did this warm up in Reykjavik. And that was the first time you see Bonham playing the Green Sparkle kit. In fact, the Tom was not mounted to the bass drum yet. So he's got it on a snare stand. Yeah. Um, if you see the photos from that gig, you can see there's a, a spare six and a half superphonic behind the drums, you know, off to the side. And, yeah. Um, and then by the time they play Bath, I believe the Tom is mounted on on the rail. But there's some new footage of that that has just recently surfaced, which is really awesome. It's silent footage. But it's really great footage to see Bonzo's brand spanking new green sparkle kit in like very good quality because it was That's professionally awesome. shot. But then Wait, they what, what, what are we talking about? Where is that footage? The Bath Festival. Oh yeah, right, right. right yeah, there's right, some right, brand right, new yeah. footage that just came yeah. that that just was released like yeah, right. eight minutes or so of it. Um, huh. Well, the whole yeah, thing from, now. There's a lot of footage because there was footage uh, at the forum in L.A. that came out recently right that was discovered yes. in cincinnati yeah. as far as i am aware so there's it's kind of crazy that, that led zeppelin you know has not been a band for a long time and this stuff has come it keeps you guys going <laughs> yeah it keeps you guys on your, <laughs> yes it on is your nice toes. to see it is nice <laughs> yeah, to when that there, are, comes up. there are fans out there um some of whom i know they're they're great guys young guys who are really they're like um history sleuths you know when it comes to zeppelin they leave no stone unturned. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, they're, they're just, they're just putting feelers out through social media and stuff. And people come up and just say, Hey, my dad saw Led Zeppelin. He was a huge fan. He saw him in 1969 and he's got some real to real tapes. I don't know. They've been in our closet since I was a kid, you know? Yes. And yep. so that kind of thing is still happening. Um, totally. Terry, Terry, I wanted to uh, give this one to Terry. Cause I'm not really sure how many, green sparkle kits there were. I don't think anyone is really sure, but Jason is the guy, obviously, to talk to. Well, see, that's get, the thing. You know, you know, honestly, Bart, you got to try and get Jason. Don't mention, George, don't get George and I <laughs> mentioned, because he might be like, are you the guy that interviewed these two freaking guys? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're around. No, yeah. so, um, oh, no, but, that. well, the thing is, is there's stories of, of Bonham, of Zeppelin being at Headley Grange, which is the house they used to rent in England. Mm -hmm. You know, them being there, and then Bonham took delivery of a, of a new kit, they said, uh, and they yeah, set that's it up. It might get loud. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Page so, says that, and it might so, get loud. So he talks about, so it's implied, it's stated that there's one kit there that they've been recording with, and there's another one comes that, they, that the roadies set up in the um, stairwell, which is where they hmm. recorded the drums for, you know, the... Um, when the levee breaks, and I think Misty Mountain Hop. I think they track Misty Mountain Hop. Definitely. Too. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Absolutely. It's the yeah, same sound. It's the same, exact same it's the sound. Same it just sound. doesn't have, you know, there's not really the Vincent or whatever on it, but yeah. it's, they yeah. sound also, the same. And that's, and that's December of 70, January 71. So right. he clearly had he had a green sparkle kit as of June of 70. Well, so he exactly. may have gotten a second kit. That's you exactly know, so. That's where we, I'm getting with. I think at least yeah. there might have been two, right? Two green sparkles. I would think there was two. There was a spare, definitely a spare bass drum. You can see photos of a spare green sparkle bass drum off behind the stage or behind the setup. Well, it's funny. There was a collector that I I got to meet and talk to about almost thirty years ago now, 
who sent me a video of I had the video up on YouTube for a while the amber drums you know it's on, you know the consensus now mostly is that the drums he actually had that he purported to be bottoms I think were not genuine mm -hmm. but he did have information that it, what he had always related to me he said that there were three green sparkle kits and I think and, that and, might be what Jason said but don't yeah. don't quote me on it I just yeah. recall reading that somewhere and I thought maybe Jason was the one who said one is with the family at the old Hyde farm still and mm -hmm. another one is 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 it at a museum somewhere Terry something like that you know and then but also too that he also said that one of the bass drums w was when he got the ba the drum set one of the incarnations the green sparkle was two bass drums a 9 by 13 a 10 by 14 a 12 by 14 and the 16 by 16 the 16 by 18 you know right. what I mean? Like he supposedly right. had a yeah. 12 by 14 inch green sparkle tom yeah, that is never perfect. been pictured with. There was supposedly a 9 by 13. Um, huh. but yeah, you know, but by those times too, you know, you always hear, you know, there did come a time where bands got so good at touring and stuff. Or, you know, like, so they'd be like, all right, well, let's keep one of these kits with Shoko in the States. We'll keep the other one in London for when we had and we record. And we'll keep the other one somewhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, my right. my question on that though would be like, like was he like if you're gonna have three green sparkle kits, yeah. he was clearly really connected to the green sparkle look instead of like going, oh, I'm gonna get one green sparkle, one red sparkle, one blue sparkle. Right. You know what I mean? Was there a reason he wanted to get three identical kits? Here's the I thing. Don't know. Uh, I don't know. I I know having a backup bass drum makes perfect sense because oh, he would, yes, you know bust a bass drum head on the gig and and right. sure which which there's actually you know it happened and there's audio recording of it where you can hear clearly his bass drum breaks but <laughs> um and robert plant says robert plant says something like you'll have to excuse us while we change the bass drum skin so oh, wow. i don't know if they had the backup there but yeah um very when descriptive they, <laughs> when they play yeah when they played in in milan in uh, 1971, there was a riot at the stadium, and the police sort of exacerbated everything by yeah. tossing some tear gas canisters out and all. Stop all lighting helped. those fires! Can you yeah. stop lighting those fires? That's what Robert Plant was told wow. to keep saying. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it's just all all hell broke loose. People rushed the stage. The band had to escape. For their lives, you know. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And run for their lives, you know, and and the the equipment got trashed, and you mm. can see photos. There's photos of the aftermath, and Bonzo's drums are strewn all over the place, and you can see like one of the floor tom legs is like all twisted <laughs> up. And so what's yeah. interesting is there's a photo of Bonzo's kit from behind, where you can see the floor toms clearly from behind, and one of the one of the mounts the leg is like this on an angle it's yeah. not straight hmm. so that would tell me that maybe that was the floor tom that got damaged in the riot and they had to screw the hole drill a new hole so it could you know sure why yeah so in that photograph he has a clear head on the back of the bass drum and, the and you side. can on the batter side you can clearly see through the bass drum and you can see the three circles and you can see that mis the mystery ring, which Terry and I have been, you know, racking our brains trying to figure out what kind of muffling that was on his front bass drum head. Yes, yeah, because even use mean, a, it's either a ring or it's a disc, or we have the new theory. Remember, we were just talking. Sorry, George. You can yeah, talk that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I I brought this up on social media recently because I wanted to just put it out there and get some feedback. But if you look at the front of Bonzo's bass drum with the thermogloss kit and with the green sparkle kit there is some sort of ring going around the perimeter it is not a um you know like a power stroke as you would conventionally yeah. think of one because a power stroke makes a particular image or you know like shadow or pattern do you know what sure. i mean where yeah, it looks yeah. a little bit darker in the center and it looks white yep. around the ring bonzo's is the opposite bonzo's looks looks darker around the perimeter and bright white in the center so i thought you know the the explanation for that is it's the opposite of a ring it's a disc 
that's like a 20 inch disc that cut out wow. and glued to the head. But then yeah. I thought that doesn't make sense. Why cut it smaller? Why not just double, basically the double thing. the thickness? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, huh. But it, but at that time there were uh, it was a thing to make a ring, and they called it a Richie ring. What was that guy's name, t uh, Terry? Richie, the drummer. <laughs> Richie you know. Ringman. No, yeah. uh, ri no, Richie. He was he was, he was born for it. No, but, yeah, yeah was, but that's yeah. what they used to do. They just fa sometimes people would take styrofoam and put it on the edge, or yeah. or, or they yeah. get you know, they'd use pieces of. But you know, and this is funny though because there was a fellow that was contacting me. He saw one of George of my videos about the possible muffling system, or the you know which was definitely there. You can see on all the drum kits this sort of what appears to be a ring or you know different color on the edge, pretty very distinct. People will always say, no, man, that's a shadow. And you're like, it's not a shadow. We're no freaks. Way. No way. Yeah. What it is. Yeah. What, what, sure. what, yeah. what I think now kind of what I think it is, thanks to this. This fellow showed me a couple drums that he got, the marching drums. And inside the marching drums, I think what a lot of people used to do in marching days is they just real quick with a can of either spray paint or something. And they just go like, and they kind of just put paint like here, just to slightly deaden the drum. And I think what conceivably could be with the bottom thing is you have the head, you take the Richie ring, set it there, take spray paint and go, pull the ring off, flip it over. It'll be whiter here and it'll be darker here. Right. You know what uh -huh. I mean? So that's, that's what I, I'm starting to suspect, I think. But you see it on mm -hmm. the Vista light, which is not a white head, you know? I'm not convinced on that, but I will say this. In those days, Terry, do you remember Rough Coat? It was an aerosol spray to rejuvenate drum heads. No. R U F F. Yeah, R U F F K O T E. And Remo bought their patent and shut it down because they were. Uh, my dad used to buy it. I remember the cans. Was of it a, a hyper cancerous thing that used to melt the hat a little bit and then no. reset it? No, it was a. It, it probably was, a, was cancerous, but <laughs> yeah, well, maybe a little. Everything cancerous. is, yeah. No, but yeah. but that wasn't the reason for it being phased out. The reason it was phased out, obviously, was it was caught putting a big dent in Remo's sales because yeah, people yeah. would sure. wear out the front of the head or the top of the head, and then he'd be like, "Oh, I'll just spray it with rough coat," and it was literally yeah. like the same coating. It was a granular kind of gritty white huh. spray paint oh, oh for, oh for like an ambassador an emperor like a coat yes yes oh, i know what you mean yeah that could be it was you a know, spray I, coat so it could have been that you know that's another possibility because rough yeah. coat existed in yeah. the 70s although yeah. i don't know if it existed as far back as 70 yeah. and bonzo had something going on i don't think i've ever seen a bass drum with that same look on the resident yeah, yeah that, that's the thing i, I have never that's interesting I mean, it, there must be with drummers like other way, you know, people might say, ah, put the easy way, put a rug in there or whatever. Or, you know, people, I don't like the way that looks or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, putting this ring, you know, maybe it was just something locally big. Like if you look at other pictures of freaking Birmingham bands, man, you might see a couple other bands. Maybe. See yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. You know, that's there's if drummers are innovative. And I mean, what it sounds like is like, I mean, like you said, adding some thickness to it with spray paint or yeah, just almost like, like a, a homemade. Yeah. There's also like a homemade uh, big fat snare drum kind of thing where you cut out an old head and you it's, put it on there and it's yeah. it show and it's took a little uh, just to that's layer it the up. Richie, that's the Richie. That's the Richie. Thing. And that was yeah, yeah. being done a long time ago. So another thing Bonham did to muff muffle his bass drum, I think, and John Paul Jones says it at one point, at was one he point. put crumpled newspaper in the bottom. My yeah. grandpa so, would talk about that. Yeah. yeah, that was a common thing like back in yeah. the day. And so yeah. you can see photos. There's photos of Bonzo's maple thermogloss kit before he has this ring type muffling resonant head. Before that point, you can see there's something in the bottom of the bass drum. And you can see it from the front, and you can see it from behind, the footage from the hmm. uh, the French TV show footage. You can yeah, see yeah. there's something crumpled up in there. Yeah, and, yeah. and John Paul Jones said he put he used crumpled newspaper. Other people have said he lined the bass drum with tin foil. Yeah, that remember that one. That point. was the big that was a big one back in the seventies. He lined <laughs> was it aluminum? Was it sheet aluminum? Was it, right. tin was it foil? Reynolds brand or <laughs> you're right, well, you're right. <laughs> you, know? you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but um, that would be like the opposite, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that make it more reflective yeah, and louder? Exactly. Loud. So, it would make yeah. it would yeah. add it would, just it would add a lot of like 
you know, punch, punch and, yeah. and high frequency. Right. But what about still- felt strips? I mean, you see a lot of felt strips in in photos of like recreation kits and things like that. Was well, he a big felt strip of- guy? He almost yeah, always he used a felt strip at the yeah, bottom of the, sure. the on, batter on the batter head. on the on the beater head. Yeah, he usually okay. at the bottom, just about maybe you know a sixth of the way up the head or whatever. Fifth Got it. Up. And I I would love to know from Jason someday, <laughs> but you know maybe that's one of those mysteries that needs to be there. You know, and who knows? Maybe Jason <laughs> feels like, man, I'm not going to give away all of my dad's secrets. You know? Yeah, I but mean, the secret is obviously in his playing. You know, all the gear stuff is fun and it's interesting, but Bonzo yeah. could play any kit and sound like himself. And Crick and Bonzo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the touch, it's in the hands. You know, that's the main ingredient. Um, you yeah. know, as far as like chasing his sound, yeah, three-ply, Ludwig, big drums, that's, that's gonna get you there sooner. But uh, I guess, you know, moving on from the Green Sparkle kit, uh, he used that kit until the end of nineteen or the end of the the European tour in nineteen seventy three. So basically, he used it all up through 70, 70, 71. He used it longer than he used pretty much any other kit. Pretty much any other kit. By by all accounts, I guess he really loved it. He loved to record. That was like a preferred kit to record with, even later. Yeah. yeah. You know, like when he was recording yeah. physical graffiti, he had the Vistalite kit. So the Vistalite kit surfaces at the beginning of May, 1973. So in April is the end of the green sparkles live. And then May of 73, when they opened in, in the U S in Tampa, um, Mm -hmm. you know, you see the brand new Amber Vistalite kit. Yeah. Right. Which talk about iconic. And let me throw this one to Terry question to Terry here. Would, so <laughs> get ready. No, but like you think of Vistalites, you think of Bonham. Really, you think of Amber Vistalite, you think of them. Is this just an anyone could pick this color at that point out of a catalog? Uh, I, I, yeah, I think so. I think what happened was is with Ludwig, I heard Ludwig put a, had a lot of faith in the Vistalite. They put a lot of um, Slingerland, to, like a lot of the companies really thought Vistalite were going to be like the way to go. Yeah. Um, Terry, what year did they first come out? What what was the first production year? I know definitely by 72 cuz I I there were you know it is I wish I just had stuff to back up. But you know, but yeah, so bottom, you know, he probably looked at the colors available and was probably, oh, the orange one looks pretty cool. You know, it is pretty interesting cuz amber when you look at it it is, I mean, probably just because of the bottom skew. You know, we just love them so much that the amber, yeah. of course, when you see it the It looks Vistalite, like fire on the stage. Yeah, right. It looks just cool as hell. It, it really literally does. looks like, you know, flames. Quite possibly maybe one of the most iconic drum sets uh, in the world where you see it and you go, that's John Bottom. You know? Distinctive. It's very distinctive. distinctive. And, yeah. and um, so there's a lot of speculation about that kit, too, and how many there were. Um, I'm assuming there were at least two bass drums. I don't know if there was, yeah. you know, more toms. Um, I don't know if there was ever a 20. There's the rumor that he played a 20 sometimes and he had the 20 at Madison Square Garden. No way. That's a 16 and an 18. Yeah, we've never, That's you e- know, yeah. It, it's, either, it's either like, um, you know, like wishful sight, wishful thinking and yeah. eyesight or... <laughs> Or it's optical illusion because of the angle of the photo gra- of the of the camera. Yeah, you know, cameras can play tricks. You know, sometimes yeah, of course. something in the foreground can look twice as big as it actually is. So if it's yeah, shot right. from that side of the floor, times it's like yeah, like Earl's Court, for example, nineteen seventy five. There are shots of Bonham from off to his right. And those toms look really big, the two floor yeah, yeah. toms. Yeah, yeah. But when you see the aerial shots in the actual it's video, run of the mill, it's, it's a sixteen and an eighteen. Yeah, you know, sure. Yeah. I've never seen so anyone who says no way he used a twenty inch floor tom, and you can see twenty two. You'll like, hear people say a twenty. I've heard people man, say a twenty two. It's like man, no way. No. No. Well, well, but you know Not, the thing is, is that he may have owned also one, two. but. But but a, a twenty you know a, a Ludwig twenty inch bass drum is also two inches deeper, so it should be easier to identify in the you know what I mean because an eight a sixteen inch floor tom and an eighteen inch floor tom pretty much by all companies in the sonar stuff are sixteen inches deep, but you get to the twenty yeah. you get eighteen, and um, you never see the big floor tom deeper than the than the sixteen. 
Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, because well, yeah, we've looked. I've been like, well, you know, and I've yeah. never seen it. Um, you know, it's interesting, too, because they keep the extra bass drum, especially Bonham with the rail. They'd have the rack tom on there, too, because if he broke the rack tom head, they'd also pick the whole thing up and set the whole thing down. That's what, that's what I, I don't know if it was Townsend or somebody told me that by the time mm. they did the uh, the green sparkle. You know, yeah. like they, oh, I mean, it's easier the tom, and quicker. They leave the tom on yeah. it, too. Another yeah. time. Did he did he break? Well, I mean, this is I feel like this is kind of a dumb question because, you know, like something a non drummer would ask. But did he break a lot of heads? I mean, was he he's such a heavy hitter and it's pretty early in the, uh, you know, the life of synthetic drum heads, 57 or whatever. We're we're, we're relatively close to the invention. Well, was he crack like breaking well, heads a lot and get him well, switched well, out? There, there is that quote from him where he talks about he's talking about his drums and he talks about a snare drum, and he says, well, that snare drum there, that head's been on there for three tours. So, yeah. th I mean, wow. that could mean, remember, 1969, they did six tours. They did four of the states. They did, You know, sure. the tour could be three weeks, or a tour could be, he could have been referring to, you know. Um, well, yeah, you can see they're pretty worn, uh, worn in a in, lot of yeah. photos. That the, yeah. the head looks really worn in. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know yeah. that he preferred... He said he prefers when the head is worn in, not brand yeah. new heads. But of yeah. course, when he wow. got the black dots, the the Vista Light kit came equipped with black dot heads, so those are much more durable. Um, pretty hard to break a black dot head. I also yeah. think that Bonham Bonham's technique changed. You know, he used to bring his arms up really high and hit with a with more arm very early on. And then he started to refine that, and he talks about it in an interview. He talks cool, about how like he was that. able to control with his wrist motion to get more power out of a stroke with a snap of his wrist. It's sort of like the the one inch punch, you know, yeah. theory of Bruce Lee. You know, where you yeah, for sure. create a lot of momentum with a with a, a jab with a well, with an amplification. That. I mean. He's if they're playing in huge venues, they don't. He doesn't need to hit as hard and project as much because it's mic'd up and and things are getting better for. That's uh, right. You know the sound guys are better and, and all. Early that stuff, on, so. sometimes the the mic the drums weren't even mic'd. Yeah, exactly. And if they were mic'd, they might have one mic overhead and one in front of the bass drum. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you know you yeah. can see in the song remains the same. For example, there's a lot of footage of him playing like this. He's not going like this all the time i mean for yeah. certain accents yes for certain dramatic yeah. you know moments um the vista lights he obviously liked the fact that they were loud and they were articulate you know that yes. they had a really um kind of a a, sh a cutting sound that could cut through the amplification yeah more yeah. i mean I'd, i've never owned a vista like kid terry you've you've owned them you could probably talk more about, you know, that the way you tune them and everything. Well, it's like I've never put, you know, ambassadors, coded ambassadors or coded emperors on them. I'd love to at some point I should just to see. But when you put the black dots on and on the bottom, you know, you have amba clear ambassadors or clear whatever. You know, you the thing is you get from the Vistalites is it's like a, it's two things. It's like a bark, but it's also like a bing. Like bing, bing, bing. And the funny thing is, is the way it, it's sort of, when you hear it by itself playing, you're kind of like, it, there's a, it's just a very distinct sort of thud. But the funny thing is, is to me, I actually prefer the sound of Zeppelin in a certain way with the sound of the Vista Lights live. There's just a certain mojo to the Vista Lights, you know? Um, you know, like I really, like especially when you hear like Moby Dick, in parts of Days Confused, where Bonham does these little patterns, it's hard to tell sometimes what is what what Tom Tom he's hitting. Um, the bass yes. drum's a little easier to identify, but you know, like when you hear like that the cool Moby Dick stuff he's playing, you don't really see any footage. You know, people for yeah. years were like, "You know, what the hell is Bonham playing there? What is the <laughs> pattern he's doing? Is, is yeah. the, are the double strokes with both hands or with just the right hand?" Right, you know? because um, the bass yeah. drum and the floor toms actually share a lot of common yeah. type sound. Three you know, like when, season. especially the 18, like when, when he does that thing in, in, in Dazed and Confused where he goes, he plays that paradiddle pattern, da -da 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 and he goes, da -da 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 you know, yeah. those last couple notes, it's hard to tell if they're, if there's a double stroke on the bass drum or if it's yeah. on the floor tom. And when yeah. you watch the film, when you look at what he's playing, he's playing two strokes on the floor tom and ending with the bass drum. 
yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. It, it sounds almost like a double stroke on the foot. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Right. This, yeah, they, the Vistalites have this really like homogeny. They there's a have uniformity. A homogenous yes. sound. Yeah. Uniformity, right. which is kind of, which is neat. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. Like when you listen to Zeppelin with that, like, you know, it's funny. Like when you listen, like when the um, 72 stuff came out that, that, what was it like 20 years ago? How the, the West um, was won. How the West was won. You know, it was cool. And so, like, like in a lot of the songs where you really don't hear the toms, you know, yeah, there's that sound. I wasn't really a fan of sort of the how the West. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> Thank you! Oh my god! Okay, that, that you have to leave in. Yeah, I, pre- I prefer I prefer the original <laughs> song remains the same drum sound to the sort of the how the West was one drum sound, um, but also to the how the West one was one is the Green Sparkle Wood Kit, you know, or at least the you know the stuff from seventy two. That in fact that's all it is, right? Isn't it all seventy two on how the West was one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's all the. So when you hear like Moby Dick. Or you hear that stuff in Days Confused, or a whole lot of lovers are doing these little like tribal patterns. You, you're definitely like, oh, there's a floor tom. There's a, you know, it doesn't have that same sort of right. neat sort of just per, total all around like chugga 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 yeah. chugga chugga. You kind of hear more like boom 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 boom. Yeah. boom, boom you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the vistas are you know, uh, but they are interesting. In fact. I'm going to loan him to George, and George is about to do – he's about to par- <laughs> undertake on something that involves the orange we'll pistolites, the amber pistolites. We'll just leave That's it That's awesome. There. Yeah, we'll I would I, – I probably wouldn't buy a kit, but I, I would gladly borrow Terry's borrow. kit. I like, I like playing – I love the sound of them, actually. I wasn't a fan of them years ago, but then oh, yeah. I, I played some – I played some at Drugan's Drum Shop here in, in uh, the Chicago area. There they are. Yeah, and it was yeah. a it was one of those um, RCI. Is that it, Terry? RCI yeah, Romano Catone International. Yeah, the, it was an RCI replica kit, and it was beautiful. They sounded great. They felt great to play. They, they're a real responsive feeling. Yeah, yeah. You know, like they have yeah, a really yeah. nice yeah, rebound. Very, yeah, yeah. Are a lot of his drums, you know. In, in, like, do they still exist? Have they been sold at auction? I know you said Jason still has a lot with the family. Uh, people have cut them down and stuff like that. But uh, what about his? Like, are there is there an existing Amber Vistalite kit anywhere? You know, fully put together. That's John Bonham's drum set. Not uh, that Terry, we know. You want to answer that? Yeah, well, that well, not, not that I know of. Well, again, there was a fellow down in, in uh, South Carolina, or North Carolina, I can't remember, who had a kit. And he sent me some video of it. I talked to him for a while. It was widely sort of like half the people in the Zeppelin drum community said it was original. The other half were kind of like, no. Um, in any case, I decided, I don't even think I put, the, I, I think I took the video down. Or I, I think I say, well, this is, I really say this has been disproven to be his kit or whatever. Sure. Um, but, you know, I don't know. There, there was a kit. There was a kit that Pat Bottom, uh, John Bottom's uh, widow, sold at auction back, I think, in 93 or 4 or 5. And this was supposedly the kit that this fella had bought in, in North Carolina. Like, if you look in books, it says his name's Bill Townsend. It says his name, you know? So, so I, again, there, was an amber, there was an amber kit that was auctioned by the family? Yes. Yeah, that, huh. that, that is for sure. You can see it. And it's so funny. In the picture, they're not set up right. You know the tom toms, the floor mm-hmm. toms are like well, two of the legs are really. You know they're they're kind of like yeah. a non drummer set it up oh, or something. To- totally. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I I really don't know. I mean, I, I'm assuming Jason has a kit, you know, or the family has a kit. Yeah. Um, you yeah. never know. Jimmy Page might have a kit that, uh, you know, was was one of the touring kits. Um, hmm. What I what uh, so last year. One of Bonzo's kits was being auctioned. The the kit that was auctioned was basically like a bebop size 18, 12, 14 with a Vista Light snare. And you can see Bonham playing this kit. You can see Jason playing it, and the song remains the same. I think it was a kit that he had probably special ordered for Jason. Yeah. Although he he, you know, certainly was playing it. You see a video of him where he's playing along with a Tina Turner tune and he sits down and Jason's yeah. got like the, the clapboard yeah, you know? yeah. and he's yeah, got a little, cool. he's got a little rubber nose on and he's clowning <laughs> around going like this. And Bonzo's yeah. sitting there just playing along 
on yeah, this little just, like that, yeah, it's like a that very way. simple beat you know very, and he's just grooving yeah. along i actually put bid on that kit i was <laughs> i was foolishly hopeful that i would win the auction and and i just you know just be honest I, I had I set my cap so it was like at eleven thousand and then it went up to like fifteen and then it just sat there for a while pre auction. So the day of the auction I'm thinking, I don't know, fifteen grand, you know, if it goes for like twenty, I might be able to swing it. <laughs> so, Come to mama. <laughs> so w- when it when that when that when that item actually went live, you know, and started ticking up, yeah, I maxed out at about twenty seven thousand. Like wow. And, 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 you know, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like, I can't really afford to spend 20 grand on a kit, let alone 25 or 30. What, what did it end up going for? It went for about, I think, around 90000 Wow. But Jeez. then there's a 20-something percent commission. Then there's the shipping charge. And then there's British via the tax. Oh, yeah. So when it's said and done, man, you're talking like well over $100,000 that kit sold for. Man. So... You know, just a little Jeez. interesting aside. You know, he had other yeah. drums. So we're talking about Bonzo's kits. He had a black swirl Vista Light kit and yeah. quite a few drums. He had concert toms. He also had double sided, like a 26, just like the green sparkle sizes or the yeah. amber Vista Lights. Yeah. But in, in the, I can't remember the name of the pattern. You know, it's a like swirl pattern, pattern C or something. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's like black. It's like black and white. Mick, swirl Mick Fleetwood owned one of the kits and had it auctioned it off. Mick Fleetwood ended up with yeah. with that kit. I think it was yeah. the big one, the one with the twenty six. But this other kit had like a couple bass drums. It had like it looked almost like a twenty or twenty two. And you can see pictures. Of, I'll send you these photographs of him playing the kit at home, and he's got Zildjian cymbals. He's got a Zildjian crash here and Zildjian hats. Hmm. And he's got wow. he's got the black swirl set up with a couple extra toms, and then behind him you can see another bass drum and some toms stacked up. Yeah, yeah. In that finish, so yeah. I have a theory that Bonzo's Montreux was recorded with multiple toms, not just his conventional setup. So at the time Bonzo's Montreux was recorded, he would have been playing likely would have been playing the Amber Vista Light kit. Yeah, yeah. But there's something about it. You can hear different tones. You don't just sure. hear one tom tone and two floor tom tones. You definitely hear at least two high tom tones. So what was yeah. he playing? He could have been playing his new black swirl Vista Light kit. He could have been playing the Ambers but had a 13 along with the 14. I mean, he's I a drummer, that, though. He he likes to play. Who doesn't? And the fact that they didn't take yeah. pictures every five yeah, minutes, right. of course. He, yeah. he's, he has home kits. He has I mean, studio ultimately, kits. he could have had anything. You know, he could have had, you know, maybe, yeah. I don't know, some band was going. Because they were they were in, weren't they in the in Montreux? Weren't they in the studio? Didn't he record that at the studio? Yeah, the casino studio? Yeah, I think so. Did or what? No, it? Mountain Studios. It Mountain, was a studio, like, yeah. studio that Queen had. Yeah. That was Queen Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so the Amber Vista Lights, he played those throughout 73, all of 75. And the last time he played those live would have been at Earl's Court in May of 75. Yeah. Hmm. Just time for um, something new. He just Time for to something new, I guess. And, and yeah. guess what was new then with Ludwig? Stainless steel. So Bonzo, in some ways, he was kind of cutting edge. You know, he was there at the beginning of Vista Light, and then he was he he got a stainless steel kit. You know, I think he he sometimes I think you know he's thought of as like this kind of conservative or traditional you know drummer, the one up two down setup, big band kind of setup, and that. But he was always kind of experimenting with with things. You know, the use of timpani, having a gong. Yeah. Um, you know the drum orchestra thing for Bonzo's Montreux is pretty. Gung, 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 gung. Oh yeah, yeah, that's your favorite <laughs> yeah. part, right? Oh, that's God. actually not a drum, by the way. That's Jimmy Page You're messing right. around with some synthesized right. effect. Some people Still think cool. that's steel drums, but it's not steel drums. Oh, it, <laughs> yeah. it just it, I gotta tell you, it drives me berserker. I wish we could just get the drums. Oh, yeah. I would love to hear that. Ha- put, have somebody else put some other, like, like a symphony over I'd the love top. to hear outtakes of that, like the different dubbed parts. Oh, yeah. Because I also right. think 
My my personal opinion is he was playing double bass drum on that. Yeah. Mm. At, at at least for certain parts. Um I think a lot of hardcore Bonhamites don't agree. They think, oh no, he, he could play anything with his right foot. Of course he could play that, but there's a certain aspect to the feel yeah. that yeah. doesn't double sound like feel. one foot playing that that uh pattern. That it has yeah. more of a swung, almost like yeah, like a log, a log, a dog, a log, a log, a log, a log. Yeah, but like, you, yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> you did, you did a great job in your in your video where you did it with one foot. That yeah, I mean, I, thank impressive. you. I, I, I mean, I think it's possible, of course, to do. You know, yeah. it just to me doesn't sound like yeah, it, right? And there's right. also it, no another important thing is there's no precedent for it. Bonzo yeah. never played that particular thing before. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? That it's not like the bass of, drum triplets. Yeah. yeah, he never played uninterrupted 16th notes in a row like that. That's going yeah. on under underneath everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, right. anyway, yeah. the jury's out on what drum kit he used for Bonzo's Montreux. Who knows? Sure. But the Ambers, yeah. the Ambers, yeah, he was done with that. And then they had some time off. And then the next big tour was 77. And that's, you know, they had recorded the album Presence. Now, Jason Bonham, I remember seeing a comment he made somewhere because somebody had made this comment about the Silver Sparkle. So this this goes to the allegations of Bonham having a Silver Sparkle kit. There's no proof for that. So I know some online sources say that was one of his kits. but. yeah. yeah there needs to be proof if you're going to make that claim. There's no yeah. proof of that kit existing. Well, you know, there's an... And that it was used on presence. So, well, Terry, I'll let you pick it up from there. Well, the reason why I say is Bill Townsend, this, this this name comes up again, said that on presence there was a silver sparkle kit. He said that Bonham at some point got a silver sparkle kit. Um, And he also referred to at the time, this was before a higher definition picture came out of Bonham's drum set up at Polar Studios in 1978 when they're recording, um, where Bill Townsend mistook the stainless steel drums in the photograph for these for Silver Sparkle, because he probably had a lower resolution picture back in 1992, you know? And, um, but yeah, there's, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I know the, I don't know any drums, you know, I, I've never, apart from that, I'd said it in videos that that's what Bill Townsend had said. Bill Townsend also said, just real fast, just to get this all out, that Bonham supposedly was going to get a, a a Black Sparkle kit for the 1980 tour, a 24, 13, 16, 18. Again, that's what he said. I've, I've said wow. that in videos over the years. Um, but then what's interesting, though, is I don't think Black Sparkle is offered in 1980, though. I know Slingerland had Black Sparkle in 80, but I don't think Ludwig did at the time. Yeah. And he could probably get what he wanted, though. You yeah, know. right. Yeah. He could. I, I just think a lot of that stuff's wild goose chase. I, I prefer to, like, no, focus on the stuff we know. Exactly. Because, because it, it gets to be such a rabbit hole with, like, speculation. And I know, yeah. like, most of this yeah. is just because people who are really into a particular artist, they get into their gear. You know, it's just natural. I mean, yeah. ultimately, none of it matters when it comes to the actual musicality of the artist. Right. I mean, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say none of it, but it's it's, it's no. a very small. It's just part. the it's the icing on the cake. It's like, more. Yeah, it's where's fun. the Vamper Visite? It's yeah. fun. Exactly. That's <laughs> I mean, the point. Is it's fun, but for me, it's not fun to speculate about. You know, there was a Silver Sparkle kid. He did this. He did that. Without having some proof. What's yeah. more fun for me is making it like when Jason. Co corrected someone something about this so he said my dad played the green sparkle kit in munich when they recorded presence i i know i was there so he was you know jason's the same age as me i think he's born in 66 yeah. so they recorded that album in what fall of 75 yeah i believe that's yeah. old um, enough to remember I mean, yeah. So if he was eight or nine yeah, years like a old, he would remember. Grader, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I remember you know things from when I was nine. So yeah. if he said the Green Sparkle kit was there, I believe it. Yeah. Um, however, later, so in '76, they start rehearsing in very late '76, early '77 for their big, their biggest tour ever. 
the biggest tour they ever did was the 77 tour and bonzo gets this iconic equally iconic stainless steel kit which was kind of a novel thing at the time um 26 by 14 15 by 12 tom 16 16 18 16 floor tom and they they they're rehearsing at the manticore studios in in london and they have like a big sound stage and there's photos from the rehearsals and you can see you know the the new kit set up and um i couldn't help but wonder like what if he got the kit a little earlier and recorded Bonzo's Montreux with it, yeah, but yeah, we'll never yeah, know that. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> you know, possible. That's possible too. Yeah. But that you know, that was yeah. that was the last kit that he that he had and used for the remainder of his career. So from seventy seven to July of eighty, which you know right. wasn't wasn't very long. No, and and as we're kind of talking about this, we kind of skipped over it a little bit. But I'm assuming his symbol. Uh, style and setup and he had the gong that stayed relatively consistent throughout uh, well i think that the gong at first, in the earlier days the gong i think might have been like 30 or 32 but i think by the time you know 73 75 77 80 rolled around i think it was a 38 inch gong right wow oh yeah it was a large one um yeah. the symbols the symbols you know he started using 2002s in 73 you can see clearly in the song remains the same. He's playing set 2002 crashes, and and I believe the hats are they look like 2002s. Oh yeah, the no, ride, definitely, definitely. They're right? Hats yeah, are. those hats are yeah. But the ride is not a the ride is not a 2002, and I think a lot of people make that mistake that they think he had all 2002s in '73, and then the song remains the same, and then yeah. Earl's Chord in '75. He had a giant beat ride still. He seemed to prefer. He obviously preferred. A giant beat twenty four. Yeah, and the belt the cuff is a lot bigger. On, yeah, on the, on the giant. You don't you there. don't see the the two thousand two twenty four until the steel kit. Yeah, till seventy seven. Yeah, gotcha. and that was all. Then it was all two thousand twos. But I think sometimes he had a six oh two over on the far right. A twenty inch medium ride he'd use as a crash. Yeah. yeah. So he had two. He had two up above the above and, and, the floor tom. And, and um and two um, he actually he got even though see I think that document Marcel Vogelman got that Pisces document that shows when Bonham got his his symbols. I think it's mm -hmm. incomplete. You can see some pictures from seventy two where he has two crashes on his left, and the you can see I think the eighteen is a giant beat, but the but the sixteen he's hitting on the underside you can see the word Pisces. Which oh, that's a, it, that's a 2002. That? That's on the list, it's, though. That's on um, the actually, list. Actually, you know, believe it or it's, not, the first 2002 that that list shows Bonham getting is a 16-inch medium in right. February of 73. Exactly. And that's yes, when but, he's playing it. But Yes, but isn't there a picture from 72 that, show, that shows him, uh, some pictures from 72 that show him with that symbol? Or is that just I early seventy three on the European tour? I don't think so. I thought it was early seventy three in Europe. Let me look at that. Uh, yeah, okay. we have to go back and look. But uh, you know that was that that corresponds to those dates in well, Europe. Yeah, well, yeah, but here's the thing: it doesn't show him getting any more two thousand twos till after the American tour. Right, right, and he's That's, clearly playing two thousand twos on the song. Remains the same. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, so, so that the, list, you know. you, that again, that, that list is not you know complete or. Not he might have called or, and said, "Let me get oh, throw this on there too, or something." Or yeah, or just bought them, you know. Yeah, but yeah it's uh, yeah. yeah, but anyway, it is yeah. So the symbols, yeah. It, well, you know how it is. We just need we need to just get Jason Bonham to open up to somebody about all the gear. I mean that for all that Bonham raises the question, and you were joking, Terry, saying, "Oh, I need to I need to talk to him." No, one of you guys need to talk to him because even talking to you two, I'm like. I'm glad I could get you guys together for this, but like, really, you guys know so much. It's like just letting, you know, kind of prompting you and letting you guys go at it. You need an absolute if if Jason would be involved in anything, it absolutely needs to be with someone who I love Zeppelin. I've loved him my entire life, but you guys are on a whole nother level of expertise and knowledge. I mean, yeah. I, I reached yeah. out to his 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 people, uh, his like through his website, his agent, you know, agency or whatever, and they said maybe in the future. Uh, 
you guys definitely need to try and get that set up. I know, I know that would be your dream because he probably holds a lot of secrets that people want to know. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Am I right? Oh, oh yeah. I would think yeah. definitely. I just wonder if how much of that is privacy. Like he wants to keep yeah. some things private, you know, sure. which is understandable. Yeah. And then I've heard from someone, you know, <laughs> the older I get, the less I can connect what I heard to the actual source. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but somebody said there's just not that much that Jason told him. Like, there's just not that much left. Yeah. You know, some things have been auctioned off. Some things were lost yeah. in the shuffle, right. maybe. Who was the other fellow we talked to? Someone else we talked to said that some stuff was stolen years ago out of a Zeppelin, like, storage unit. Uh, I don't remember, but I, I'd heard that, too. Yeah, yeah, it came from, I think, Deborah, Deb Bottom. Wait, wait, which, wait, Did Deborah Bottom say? Is De- Deborah's his sister and Zoe's his daughter? Yes. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. One one of Zoe or Debbie or Deborah took lessons from somebody. Zoe. Yeah. I yeah think it was Zoe. Zoe. And, and she, he asked. That's her about, the like, source. Yeah, that's the source. Yeah. That's the, who was that? Do you uh, remember who? I think it's the fellow, the DM one ninety. Remember we did that interview with the D- drum man right. like one ninety guys. Right. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Good That's dudes. right. Yeah, one of the fellas on there had taught her. You know, he had given her some lessons. lessons. And, and she said, said, you know, a lot of my dad's stuff is just, it was yeah. stolen or just Jeez. You know, disappeared. Yeah. Terrible. So. But, you know, I mean, but it is cool. You know what I mean? Like, we've been trying. George and I have the committee. It's it's housed in the uh, what's the building that got broken into the Watergate building? It's the committee. <laughs> it's the committee. It's the committee to Chief try Gordon and get Liddy committee. The, yeah, yeah. The, the the outtakes from the song remains the same. Where you just like yeah. you know a guy camera guy you know just anything. Maybe yeah, if there's any sound. It's like over Bonham's shoulder, and he's like, yeah, you know, I mean, totally. just, just anything. Give us any footage with Bonham. Treasure trove. Trust, I mean, it's gotta you, be out there. Anything. You look at like the get back stuff with like the Beatles and, and Peter oh, Jackson man. putting it together. You need some kind. I mean, who knows what could happen down the Can road? You imagine? All this I stuff mean, just comes out. When I saw the get back uh, film, I was thinking, wow, Glenn Johns was just in the studio a few months earlier with, with Zeppelin. Yeah. Cause wasn't that January of 69? Yeah. Get yeah. back. Yeah. 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 So then in October, October of 68, he recorded the first album. Yeah. Wow. You know, and how cool Maybe that Maybe someday. Would... And then you yeah, hear a, co- a couple times John Lennon, who could be a little acerbic, is sort of like, hey, Glynis, start the tape machine. Because there was an actress in England named Glynis Johns. <laughs> Glynis so Johns. Funny. Yeah. yeah, so wow. Glynis Glyn would be like, yeah. like there's that scene in, in, in the guys are recording. Uh, uh, what's the one? The, the Stones. Please allow me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And they're yeah. sitting there, and and uh, Keith Richard, and Mick Jagger, and Brian Jones are sitting there, kind of working something out. And Glenn John kind of walks out, and he goes, "I'd like to get some levels." And K- Keith Richard goes, "Not now." <laughs> just <laughs> like, geez, <laughs> easy. Just, yeah. That's it. And Glenn John just kind of goes like, <laughs> just walks away. Just, oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. goes, Not now. Wow. Well, just well. like. They're well, the stars, maybe, you know. Uh, maybe at some point some photos will surface from some of these sessions. Yeah. So, you know, the fellow Bonomaniacs who are really into this and into the knowing about the gear used on specific albums and stuff. I mean, live we pretty much know because there's a lot of photographs of them live and there's a lot there's footage. But in the studio it would be really interesting to see what he was playing. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know? Wouldn't it would be funny? There's gonna a picture's gonna turn up from uh Stargroves. There's going to be like a freaking uh, a 2012 14 freaking Rogers kit. And, I'm, and, <laughs> yeah. and that will be hanging I mean, me and George. I mean, you never know. There, you know, when that auction was the auction like for you the You got to go with the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so we'll you have know, to redo the, the video. <laughs> <laughs> From jail. Yeah. Like. <laughs> the auction the auction of the Black Diamond Pearl kit, Yeah, there was a comment in there that said, drums, drums that were played by John Bonham on When the Levy Breaks. Like yeah. there was this statement that yeah. just like this is the kid he used. So at first I was like, "What? You know, that's total BS." Um, but then I was like, "Well, how do I know?" Yeah, There's right. no photos. Yeah. What if that was the kid that Bonham remembered that kid and was like, 
hey, I want to use this kid for a couple tunes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You never know. Yeah. Robert man. Plant might have been the one who said, this is the drums, mate, that Bonham played. Yeah, right. You know, that's true. Yeah. See, that's on true. When the Levy you know? Breaks. And that, yeah. I don't know. Whoever that person was that was doing the auction, you can look at it. If you Google John Bonham Black Diamond Pearl and then auction, you'll find it. And you'll see pictures of plants standing behind the kit like this. Wow. You know? I mean, so it's it's legit. It's legit. Yeah. Oh man, it's 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 easy to run away with the speculation, but I like how George you said that it's it's you gotta stick with it and this is this is factual true stuff. Um it's it's unbelievable. Hopefully st- more stuff turns up. Um this has been awesome. I guess the last question I would have, gear wise, what sticks would he have been using? You know, you don't have to go super detailed as we're <laughs> <laughs> Terry Terry has them. There you go. <laughs> well, I have right here in my possession. These are these are what I call the Bonzolian two A. They just happen to be for sale. Oh, there we go. No, but but what these are is these are essentially more or less these are based on the Ludwig two A of your that Bonham really, really supposedly loved. You know, and okay. it has a nice taper mm-hmm. and stuff. But, yeah, you know, yeah. we talked about, I mean, he really, there was a Pruko stick he liked. There was supposedly a Premier stick maybe he liked. There were some sticks that looked to be Ludwig's, but they don't look like, they don't look like two A's or two B's. They look like something else. They look thicker, but the beads just look a little bigger. This is a pair of Dino Donnelli 2A Ludwig. Now, I have other pairs of 2A Ludwig, not Dino Donnelli signature, yeah. from from a little earlier than this. I think these are more mid-70s, mid-late 70s. Bigger I beard, have right? some 2As from the early 70s, and they look more like Terry's reproduction stick. Yeah. This bead is different. Do you see this bead? It's a little bit more like an acorn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The 2A bead is a little bit more of a capsule. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So I think the Dino Donnelli stick is slightly different. Than yeah. the conventional oh, oh, stock Ludwig two A. I, I, I actually prefer it. Actually, I like the beads a little bigger. And do you see the taper here and the right the neck just yeah, before yeah. you get to the bead? Does it's it very thin. Yeah, yeah. So my my gut feeling is Bonzo went through a lot of these on a gig. Sure. I think they're thinner than yours, Terry. Oh really? Yeah, they're very thin. I mean these these crack. If I made a video with these, mm-hmm. this pair would probably be cracked by the end of the video. Well, yeah. you know, the funny I thing mean, is... I mean, they last maybe a couple, a few tunes. The, well, the that. funny thing is, is these sticks I had, this fella in Wisconsin, Leroy from Lua, um, <laughs> yes. ma- that, that they're very, very durable, and the finish is very, anti, is very anti-slip. You know, yeah, I'd always heard the 2A or the 2B. I made those because I thought they'd be cool. It's a stick I haven't seen for a long time. Yeah, totally. What's um, interesting is there's a photo of Robert Plant at a sound check. From seventy five, it was the first day. Oh, behind the drums. Behind the drums. In. Yeah. He's sitting behind the drums and yeah, okay. and and I, I think right around that time was when he started getting the Promuco custom stick, his own stick. Yeah. So I find it interesting that up until then he didn't he didn't have his own stick as one of the top rock drummers yeah. in the world. Yeah, really. really? He was yeah. using Dino Donnelli sticks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. And Eventually, he had this guy. What's the guy's name from Promuco? He he created these custom sticks for many rock drummers in England. Mm. Cozy Powell and Mitch yeah. Mitchell, and you know a lot of guys were using his his custom sticks. And Bonzo's Promuco sticks are they reissued? They 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 made a recent issue of the John Bonham Promuco stick, but it's it's not the same. Yeah, it's, it's not sure. It's a similar length and width. But the bead is different, and the taper yeah. is different, and you know un- that's unfortunate to me because I, I really wish they would have just made the replica stick. Just do it exactly. Yeah, but they didn't. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, so. it, it's, it's, Who knows it's, if Promuco is even the same Promuco? They might have yeah. got bought by some other company, and well, they just well, slapped the John Bonham's Promuco name is, on it. You the know? Promuco is they do make sticks, but the sticks are a lot. They're they're kind of lower quality generally. Like they seem like the sticks you go with an entry level snare drum and yeah, stuff, yeah, like sure. you know. But the <laughs> Pramuco John Bonham signature that they did come out with a few years ago, they are a high quality hickory stick. They they yeah, do they are. Uh, they, and it's a nice playing stick. I actually kind of think it's a really nice stick. It's it's almost like a a regular sort of five uh, A, everybody's sort of five A, but with sort of the shaft 
that goes from under the bead to the stick, which is a little more like the original bottom pramuko. Like that's similar. Like like in the in the the bottom pramuko, it like tapers like this almost perfectly straight, and then goes to the stick. and then cuts. Yeah, then but cuts. the bead is really different. The bead is yeah. The bead is like a five A nowadays, but the original pramuko was a little different. Well, that's yeah, interesting. So, but like, like you said, with everything, that he probably just burned through them. And if he had sticks sitting around, like he probably tried a bunch of stuff, and he probably played yeah. tons of different sticks, just because. I mean, there's sticks you just you break them and you well and i think once he yeah there they are i think yeah. once he got the promuco see, like, see that big ass see that that like yeah that's like a big firth bead yeah, yeah that is that's like a big firth bead that's not like so christmas instead of it being bead. more tapered yeah but yeah, yeah kind of the, like the his were kind of like an olive yeah. seed you know sure. yeah 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 exactly yeah. yeah but you know i think his his tech mick hinton said they had like a what do you call it a gross yeah, gross 144 of pair. Yeah, 144 pair. Yeah. Yeah. He said there was always a gross of sticks right off to his side. You know, wow. Because yeah, I'm sure. sure he... I mean, if he was playing these, he th they must have been tips must have been flying off. Yeah. Uh, do those I mean, appear to be no hickory, way. or do you think that they're maple? Oh, these are hickory. They are okay. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So. Well, that sticks. I mean, I think there's so much. And, and uh, we will maybe down the road. I feel like his recording and the mic techniques is an entire other conversation, which could go on for a long time. But for yeah. uh, for the yeah. sake of now, um, as we wrap up here, I think this has been awesome. I think, uh, you know, if you're listening to this on uh, as a podcast, there has been photos inserted the whole time. So when, when they're referring to something, there's gonna be a photo on the screen, uh, which you, you would have seen if you're watching on YouTube, but yeah. um, be sure to, I'll put the link for the YouTube video in the description of the audio format. Um, so if you are listening, go ahead and if you want to hear it again, an hour and 40 minutes of us talking about Zeppelin, <laughs> mainly, the, mainly these two talking about Zeppelin, then uh, do that. But as we wrap up, is there anything you guys want to, maybe promote um, your, your own channels and all that stuff. Uh, whoever wants to go first, you know, tell them about where they can find you. This is the George Flutus PFOZ apparel wear. With this phallus on <laughs> yeah, the it's front. a little hard to make blim, that out. Blim, 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 <laughs> Looks blim, like Moby blim, Dick. Blim, blim. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Moby's what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so anyway. But yeah, so George, of course, has PFOZ. He's got Bonomology channel. I have the Bonzolium channel. I'm doing that new music with my friend Ty Vare, who's singing with PFOZ. He's doing the, uh, the Zeppelin bits there, the, the cool. Robert Plant vocals, which is amazing. You got, I mean, that stuff is, I don't know how these guys do it. There should be like a documentary on the making of PFOZ stuff. <laughs> there should, I'm, I'm serious. The well, you guys put it I don't, together, so. you know, um, PFOZ is People's Front of Zeppelin. It's a silly name for a really good uh, cover band, virtual Zeppelin uh tribute we do on on youtube so it's a youtube channel people's awesome, front of yeah. zeppelin and uh we don't play in the same room together ever although one day we hope to do that um <laughs> you know it's like a virtual band thing yeah. and uh i i have a a drum sample pack and loops that um came out recently through yurt rock which is a really great organization that has featured a lot of top tier drummers um you know playing playing their own beats and uh for loops and samples and mine is is under the name bonomology so it's basically bonomesque you know style sure. uh drum beats for for looping and sampling so awesome. you can check that out at yurt rock and i'm yurt. just you know yurt y-u-r-t yep rock love yeah. a good yeah. yurt good yeah. yurt <laughs> good yurt yes and then no, there's that'd be rock <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's not available stuff, to TP right. Yeah, your rock stuff is awesome. Uh, <laughs> yes, I yes, will put descriptions uh, links to all the description. Obviously, Bonzolium Terry, your stuff is awesome as well. Um, Thank you, bro. Both of you guys have your your videos and your channels are just like uh, it. Never any anyone that I put on either of you guys, it is always just fascinating. And I'm like, I love Bonham. You can go from being you know little bit interested to Bonham to someone who's kind of like a history nerd who really likes Bonham, but you guys are obviously next level to the 
master bonzo bonzo like freaks as we'll say in a good way i don't know how this happened <laughs> yeah. you mean the, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the masters and it we'll is. but you it's interesting for everyone i think uh <laughs> there you go all right he's got um, the fez out yeah the fez <laughs> is on that, that means it's time to quit that means it's uh, time to go yeah, yeah yeah that's the original grand pooba one yeah but uh anyway what you guys do is just incredible um so Check the description um, for everyone who's listening or watching to see. I mean, most people know you guys. If you're listening this to this and you're an hour and 50 minutes into it, you've probably heard uh, <laughs> what George and Terry are doing. Has um, it been that long? Wow. It just flew yeah, by. It did. And it'll be a little shorter because we'll clean stuff up. But um, that's good. <laughs> before we end, though, I do want to give a shout out to um, I hope to say his name right. Stefano Ashbridge, who joined up uh, with the Drum History Podcast Patreon at a certain level, uh, which is 15 bucks a month where he gets a shout out. So uh, thank you to Stefano. And actually, his brand is drum lessons in L.A. dot com. Oh, so, wow. Nice. Uh, Okay. Check out drum lessons in LA.com. And because he's at that tier, he gets now his name at the end of all the YouTube videos, uh, which I always say to people, that's a very cheap way to advertise your brand is to do Patreon at that level. You get your name. There's that's very, six very or seven cool. on there. And nice. um, lots of different people have been doing it with drum brands and shops and podcasts and stuff. Nice. So thank you to Stefano for doing that. Uh, it really helps support the show. Um and on that note, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time and uh, joining me back on and giving me all your your bottom. Again, I feel like you guys, I kind of let you talk most of the time because it's <laughs> as a bottom <laughs> fan. But, uh, you know, it's hard to add information that you guys don't know or to bring something up because you guys know so much. Well, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it always helps and feels good, though, to get questions, you know, sure. to, yeah. to stimulate the yeah. conversation. So Otherwise, you guys are just talking at each other about Bono. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so from, it's, from, it's really, the no, it's really enjoyable to do this. And Yes. You know. No, the pleasure prompted. is all mine. Yep, yeah. cool. Well, um, this is awesome, so thank you guys for being here and uh, sharing photos and everything that's been throughout the video with me. And, uh, cool. Uh, hopefully we'll all be able to hang out at a future like Chicago oh, yeah. drum show or something like that. And you're and, in Cincy, uh, right? Cincinnati. I'm in Cincy. Yep. Nice. Okay. That would be yep. great. I'll, yep. I'll hit you up if I'm coming to Cincy. Yeah, for sure. Please do. Cool. Yeah. Right. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Thanks, fellas. Bart, I appreciate man. it. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks so again, Bart. All yeah. right.